So, hop. Hi, Nidhi. Hello, Maru. How are you? All good? Yes, all good. All right, so we're live now. And I want to thank Lauren and Heather, first of all, for all the behind the scenes work and their support to make this happen. It wouldn't be possible without them. And also thanks to the PTGA for providing this opportunity to get together and talk about citizen science and education. It definitely makes me feel more connected to see you here, Nelly. Yeah, so before we get started, <laughs> just a short interaction about myself. So I started working in the industry back in 2014 on ship-based expeditions to Antarctica. So even though I have a very different background to many of my colleagues, I always loved outdoors and my first jobs were a Zodiac driver, camping guide, safety driver for the kayaking program. And as the seasons went by, I transitioned into my current roles as passenger services manager and AL. And I also had the privilege of working in the Arctic as last season. Nelly, I can see your skis in the background. Um, I already put those away and pulled out my summer gear. You can see it in my background. Um, although living in Ushuaia, you never know what could happen. So I might pull my skis out again anytime soon. Um, why don't you tell us a bit about yourself and your connection to the polar regions before we get started? Yeah, thank you, Maro. Um, I'm super excited. And thanks again also to the PDJ for having me and um, for allowing us to talk about this great topic. So a little bit about myself. I have a background as a scientist. So I studied marine biology in Germany, Denmark, and New Zealand. And it was New Zealand where I had the chance to go down to Antarctica for the first time as part of a postgraduate certificate in Antarctic studies out of the University of Christchurch. And like everyone else, as soon as you have been down there once, you are infected with a polar bug. So when I returned from New Zealand, I did my PhD at the German Polar Research Institute studying humpback and minke whales in the Southern Ocean. But then in the same year as you, in 2014, I switched to full-time guiding and I have been working as a guide in the Arctic and Antarctic. Typically, I work as a marine mammal lecturer on board, but I also quickly became involved in the onboard citizen science and education programs, either as citizen science or education coordinator. Thank you, Annette. So just a quick note, we are going to be accepting uh, questions throughout the talk, but we're going to be addressing those at the end of our talk so we don't interrupt the flow of it, but also um, some of the questions that you might be asking, um, we might cover them throughout our conversation. So please go ahead, type them on Facebook. We'll be answering those at the end of the talk. So Nedi, before we dive into ideas on how to use citizen science as a tool to become better educators, I would like to bust a few misconceptions about citizen science. I remember when I met you back in 2015, we both um, were working for polar latitudes and it was the beginning of the season. We were sitting at a team meeting and a colleague of us introduced this whole brand new citizen science program. I had never heard of this term before, even though I had a connection to science, this citizen science thing was so new to me. So maybe you can give us a quick explanation of what citizen science is? Yes, sure. So there are actually quite a few different definitions floating around, but the bottom line of all those definitions is that citizen science is defined as scientific work undertaken by members of the general public. All right. So what you mean is that even without any training in science, without being a scientist, we can still do it. I mean, surely there must be some prerequisites. Yeah, exactly. That is the beauty about citizen science, that anyone can participate. You don't need a degree. The only thing that you need is a little bit of time and a lot of enthusiasm. Ha, time. So I'll get back to that in a few minutes. But focusing on citizen science, I mean, surely it must be a pretty new concept, right? I mean, I didn't know about it. I haven't heard about it. Can you tell us a bit about the history of citizen science? Yeah, the history is actually quite interesting because the concept of citizen science is not new. Citizen science has long histories in meteorology, astronomy, and ornithology, to name a few. And it is actually dating back to at least the middle of the 19th century. And I'm sure that many of you have either participated or heard about a citizen science project without really realizing it. And I wanna give you an example. So 
some of you might have heard about the Christmas bird count. And this is one of the oldest citizen science projects and it has been running since 1900, so for more than 100 years now. And it has actually quite a funny story because the Christmas bird count was started in North America in an effort to change a different tradition, the Christmas side hunt. So the side hunt was an event where locals would hunt all animals and birds that they could on Christmas day. And then the team that had most of the kills was declared the winner. But then in 1900, there was this guy, an ornithologist, Frank Chapman, and he began this new tradition. So he introduced the Christmas bird census. So counting birds on Christmas day instead of killing them. And the project has been running every year since then. So changing killing for counting, I'm in. So last question before um, we dive into using citizen science to become a better educator. I know you're a founding member of the Polar Citizen Science Collective. So do you want to tell us a bit about the Polar Collective and what's your past and current involvement in citizen science? Yeah, so I was extremely lucky that when I started working in the industry, I was working for two companies that had adopted citizen science programs very early on. And those companies were Polar Latitudes and Geoadventures. And I was jumping between the two companies. And because of that, quite naturally, we also passed projects from one company to the other. So following the concept of Antarctic science and also the vision of the former operations manager of Polar Latitudes that science, so in this case, citizen science, should be shared and freely available to everyone, a colleague of mine from Polar Latitudes, Bob Gilmore, and two of my colleagues from G-Adventures, Lauren Farmer and Dr. Alex Cowan, as well as Ted Cheesman, the co-founder of Happy Well, decided to form the Polar Collective, which we introduced for the first time at the Field Staff Conference in Iceland in 2017. And since then, we have become a registered charity in the UK, and we have also developed a fancy mission statement, which is to create opportunities for research and public education through citizen science, and by this leveraging the reach of polar travelers to enhance the understanding and protection of the polar regions. That is a fancy and a bit complicated mission statement. Do you mind giving us some more details about how the Polar Collective are planning to achieve this? Yes, sure. So we at the Polar Collective, we see ourselves as the link between the scientists and the two operators. We all know that there is data deficiency in the polar regions and that research down there is extremely expensive. Yet we as the industry provide a much needed so-called platform of opportunity for scientific research. So we thought, why, why aren't we utilizing it? Yeah, so sure. what we are doing is we are working with the operators to help them incorporate a citizen science program into their individual itineraries and to make their program successful. And then we're also working on providing a training platform for guides where they can get access to all the required training and resource material needed to successfully conduct a project during a trip. And then, of course, we're also working with the scientists to develop citizen science projects that will work with the unique modes of operation that we have in the polar regions. So this is like allowing for high quality data collection, being executable within an operator's travel itinerary, and then of course having a component of guest engagement and education. Awesome. So I know that public education is a big part of your work at the Polar Collective. So let's start talking about how we can use citizen science as a tool for becoming a better educator. Why should we, as guides, consider using citizen science as an educational tool? Yeah, that's actually the really exciting part about this talk. So we heard two weeks ago from Lisa Kelly um, that education is at the core of our polar operations. And we are using education every day when we're interacting with our guests, be it formally, via lectures, or in a more informal way when we're out on excursions. And as guides, especially those amongst us that are certified by the PTGA, we learn about interpretation skills such as the Torah principle that Kobe and Ian have touched upon in previous talks to become better educators. And as lecturers, we spend hours of our time working on the lecture material to bring our knowledge across better. So why shouldn't we increase our educational toolbox by looking at how easily citizen science can help us with being a better educator? And I still remember really well when I went out on my first citizen science zodiac cruise ever. I went out with a group of guests for a phytoplankton collection and I can tell you I was extremely nervous because I thought that the guests would ask me all this like super tricky science questions um, that I wouldn't know the answer to. 
But I was proven totally wrong. And what ended up happening was this really fantastic dialogue where guests started asking more in-depth questions. And we ended up talking about phytoplankton and the bigger part that it all plays within the ecosystem and also how it eventually affects us all back at home. So when I returned back to the ship, you know, I was totally stoked on what possibilities having guests participate in a citizen science project offered me as a guide and educator. If you were feeling nervous, it makes me feel so much better. <laughs> so this means that apart from your specific background on marine biology, it gave you more tools and possibilities as a guide, right? So let's say I'm a general naturalist working on a ship. Could you give us a few more examples on how citizen science can help guides to better educate or communicate their knowledge to guests? Yeah, so education and citizen science are intertwined in many ways. And the beauty is that citizen science can complement our existing educational framework that we apply during our trips anyways. And I want to give you three really concrete examples here. So it allows guests to actively learn and by that retain information better. So for operators that cross the Drake, quite often what we would do is we offer something on the sea days that we call a wildlife watch. So where we, we encourage the guests to come outside on the deck and take a look at the birds and the marine mammals that we might see. We might have already had previous talks, you know, where we told the guests about the potential species and their characteristics and how they can identify them. And typically the birder or the marine mammal person will be out on deck as well, helping guests identify the different species. So now imagine you're out there on deck with the guests and you're also doing a citizen science bird survey while you're doing your wildlife watch. So again, you explain the different species to the guests and the characteristics, but now that they are actively involved in looking out for those species for the survey, they become much better at learning how to identify them. And we all know that by actively participating in something and practicing what we have learned, we learn much better and we retain that information better than by just passively listening to something like a talk or a lecture. Yeah, for sure, agreed. Um, though that sounds great when we're at sea and you know we focus on lecturing and education anyways but can you give a, some examples on how citizen science can help improve our educational skills during operation days yes so um here's another example i think and it's quite simple it gives us guides other topics to talk about and as a good educator you should have a wide range of topics to talk about after the third landing at a Gentoo colony, we have probably told our guests everything we know about Gentoos. After the third Zodiac cruise, we have covered most of the usual topics we talk about, and for sure all our guests know now why ice is blue. So imagine again, you're out there in your Zodiac, and you're cruising around in an amazing area, and you can now engage your guests in a citizen science project. And there are actually quite a few that you can easily do out there in your Zodiac. If we take as an example, NASA's um, Globe Cloud project, where we can engage guests in observing clouds. This opens up an entirely different conversation. So you can now chat about what different clouds exist in the polar environment. We can learn um, from the clouds. We can learn what this means for the region. We can learn how we use them um, to identify weather systems and how we use them to make decisions about our daily operations. And just like that, you have an entirely different area to talk about it keeps your cruises interesting and it also it also gives your guests a much more comprehensive education. Yeah, you can even use it um, to explain why you made a decision and you turn your zodiac around and went back to the ship. Um, so Neri, in my experience, most citizen science projects in the polar regions have a big component of studying effects on climate change. And you know that usually is a tricky topic to address. Do you think citizen science can help with discussions about those tricky topics? Yeah, I totally think that because from experience, I think that it allows to talk about those um, tricky topics way more naturally. And I believe as guides, we all have this range of topics that we know we should talk about, but sometimes it might be really tricky to find the right entry to start such a conversation. And here is where citizen, sci citizen science can really be a helping hand. So imagine again, you're out there in the polar regions and now we're out in Antarctica on shore with a group of guests and we're doing an onshore bird survey. So one of the tasks will be to look at the breeding status of the penguins. And while the guests are busy trying to identify if the penguins have still eggs or if there are already some chicks, 
pretty much every time the question comes up on how what they see compares to other seasons. So by participation in this project, you know, it triggers the guests to think and inquire about potential differences between the seasons themselves. And basically they invite you to start the conversation about climate change. Mm -hmm. So, you know, listening to you, I think having guests start thinking about provocative topics for themselves sounds a lot like one of the key concepts of the Torrent model we learned about last week, doesn't it? Yeah, so if you want to get a little bit more theoretical here, um, if we do think back about the Torrent system, as educators, we want to make a difference with our interpretation. And one of the key concepts, if you want to achieve exactly this, is to use interpretation not only to entertain or teach, but to provoke guests to think for themselves. So I guess we can say that by having guests participate in citizen science projects, we have a win-win situation because we are allowing for thought-provoking interpretation in a natural way, which is then also triggered by the guests. Okay, so, you know, I see the educational value of citizen science. Um, I know it, I experience it, but, you know, it does sound like a lot of extra work. So how can I make it work on my already super busy schedule? I mean, especially during operation days, I barely have time to brush my teeth. And believe me, I need to brush my teeth before starting the day. Otherwise my mood, oh my gosh. So how can I combine these projects with my current duties? Yeah, of course, like anything that we do, there is a bit of time involved, but I think we have to look at this question from two different perspectives. So we need to talk about two sections here. One is preparation time and then the time needed to actually do the project. So if we focus on prep time first, Yes, of course, there is preparation time involved to become familiar with the project, but this ideally happens prior to the season. And then I would say it is comparable with all our other pre-season preparations, like updating lectures, you know, refreshing our memories on wildlife, plants, geology, and such. And I can find the information I need on the Porter Collective website, right? Yeah, eventually, once our training platform is up and running, it will all be there. For now, um, for all those keen um, guides out there, you can check out all the information about Antarctic projects in the form. Okay, perfect. Yeah, and then also for preparation time, we have to look at preparation time on board. And this is typically very limited. It is hardly any to maybe like 15 minutes. But I think it is also key to remember that you need to prepare your guests by introducing the projects early on the trip so that they are ready when projects are happening because not all projects happen when you announce them. And I wanna give you a quick example why this is so important. So. A few years ago, you and I we were on a trip to South Georgia and we had given them like the citizen science introduction. Everyone knew what different projects we had. And then when we crossed to South Georgia, we suddenly came across the super aggregation of humpback wells out there. And, you know, of course, everyone grabbed the camera and went outside. But because they knew how important humpback whale flukes are for happy whale, you know, we had like this amazing conversation out on the decks. Everyone was shouting, did you get that fluke and fluke over here? And, you know, lenses were crossing. And we had so many fantastic photos. We sent them all into Happy Well, and we managed to actually double the humpback well catalog, you know, for the region of South Georgia. So preparation is really key to that. That that was a fantastic afternoon, and those shots they were amazing. Yeah, they, they really were. <laughs> yeah. And then, so the the second part, you know, for this time question is the time that you need to, to conduct the project. And the projects that have been floating around in the industry and are supported by the Polar Collective, they are selected in a way that they don't take up too much extra time. So anything from a few minutes to a maximum of an hour, because we do understand that extensive time to conduct the project is a major limitation for making it successful. So to make a really, really long answer short, I personally don't really consider the time commitment as an issue. Because if we think of all the other activities we do to entertain and educate our guests, such as bar activities, camping, kayaking, you know, they are all really time consuming activities, but we do them because we see value in them for our guests. All right, good answer. And I'm going to keep that answer you gave, the short answer, I'm going to keep it with me. So next time I'm on board, time won't be an issue. 
<laughs> Neri, speaking of guests, I could imagine that for some people, you know, for some guests might be a bit too much to talk about science. It is, it sounds like a big word. So some of them might be a bit hesitant about citizen science. How do you make it attractive to them? Yes, so the key, I think, is to keep it fun and engaging. And citizen science is really not complicated. So make sure that you sell it in that way. And I believe that it's best to have and show enthusiasm because we all know from anything that we do, if the guides are excited, the guests are automatically excited as well. Okay. And I want to give you an example of a really enthusiastic colleague that we have worked with. He works as a Kaya guide in the polar regions. And he is the most enthusiastic person I know when it comes to NASA's GLOBE cloud project. And I learned so much from him and just, you know, helping him doing the cloud observations and watching him do it. So he always had like this big group of guests that joined him. And he has this little book about clouds where you can actually get points for all the different cloud types that you see. And this book is, believe it or not, published by something that is known as the Cloud Appreciation Society. Yes, this really exists. And it's a really cool okay. book that you can have. And guests love it because they kind of keep adding up, up their points. And you know, in the end, it is how guests connect with guides, which comes back as positive feedback to the company. Exactly. Um, you know, as a PSM, I do get a lot of feedback about many things. But one of the things that always comes up is how much guests enjoy spending time with the guides. That's what they want to do. That's what makes their experience. And they also comment on how much they enjoy participating on all the citizen science projects that we offer. So why don't we talk a bit more about the educational value for them, for the guests? Yeah, I think guest comments and reactions are actually a really important way to measure our success as guides and as educators. And we either hear this, like you say, directly from them on board or then via the feedback forms. And above, we have already talked um, about some of the concrete examples, you know, how we guides can use citizen science to educate our guests better. But I think that there's an even bigger, maybe a little bit hidden educational value that I would like to touch upon here. Sure. So in general, citizen science enables lifelong learning, and it is a form of simultaneous learning and knowledge making. So it enables our guests to enhance their scientific literacy because by participating in different citizen science projects, they are increasing their own knowledge and understanding about how science works and also the different research methods that scientists use. By engaging our guests in scientific research via citizen science, we can also build stronger connections between them and science. And access to scientific research has never been more important to provide you know, a really good basis for debates on critical issues such as climate change and global health than nowadays. And a deeper and broader understanding of how science works is actually a really powerful asset against fake news. And we have plenty of those around nowadays. Oh, yeah. And then, like, if you want to go even higher, we know that participation in a citizen science project could trigger guests to continue being involved in science back at home. So we know in general that citizen science projects can empower entire communities to make a difference in their immediate environment um, by raising their social well-being or whatever project they're pursuing. You know, think about all the cleanup projects that have been happening around the world. This is all community work. So who knows what great things our guests will do after we have laid some of the groundwork by introducing them to the world of citizen science when they've been on one of our trips. Yeah, for sure. I agree. It, it is a powerful tool and we should be using it. I, I bought it. Um, so listening to this, Annette, I think we're starting to touch on something bigger. You know, a really important topic within the industry has been, and it's going to continue being, sending guests home as ambassadors. So do you think citizen science can help with that task? Yes, I, I think so. But to answer the question, I think we should ask ourselves first how we can actually create ambassadors. So I believe, first of all, taking them to those incredible regions is a very good starting point. But I think to become an ambassador for anything, you need to be touched by it in a way so deeply that it completely rocks your world. And to get this feeling, you need to have experienced it. So by ensuring that our guests have those incredible experiences, and experiences that I think we as guides have all made in the polar regions ourselves, 
we are playing a really important role in creating ambassadors. So yes, using education in all its different ways, is it via lectures, chats, or citizen science to create those experiences will help us succeed at that. Because then every time our guests think or hear about the polar regions, they are put right back to their trip. And there is a quote from a guy that some of you might have heard of. His name is Sir David Attenborough. I think he's quite famous. And right. he has said, no one will protect what they don't care about and no one will care about what they have never experienced. So don't underestimate how much citizen science can enrich the guests' experiences. They get a chance to participate in science firsthand. And this is something that many guests have actually never done before and they, they really enjoy it. Also, the feeling that you know through their participation, they are contributing to science is often a really big deal for them. And we see this on the you know, many common forms. The guest of today doesn't want to be just a tourist anymore. They want to give back to the places they visit. And you know, there, there are so many great stories on how citizen science has impacted our guests right there on board, but also you know, when they're back at home. Yeah, and you know, I, I'm with you that enriching our guests experience is key to creating ambassadors and citizen science might have the potential to change our passenger behavior even when they're back at home and this reminded me of this one guest who sailed with us and she took part on the clouds project the nasa clouds project and when she went back home of course during this tough months she couldn't leave home um, had very few activities to do she needed to stay busy in a way so she kept on watching clouds registering um, everything she was seeing so she kept on doing science and that kept her busy so i'm pretty sure that you with all your experience you might have many more examples like this one do you want to share them yeah of course yeah that's actually a really cool program you know to help citizen science get you through this terrible time at the moment. Um, so let me think. Um, yeah, there's actually one, pro yeah, I could highlight one um, example where guests were impacted right there during the trip. And so it was, it was one of those like stunner in the Arctic days. And we were south of the circle, we were at Stonington Island, and I was out with a group of guests for our um, Fjord Fido citizen science cruise. And we dragged the net behind the boat and... Um, did they bring you back? Yes, they did bring me back. So um, so when we when we got the phytoplankton net back on board, we could see that it was completely yellow. And this means that we must have sampled right within a phytoplankton bloom. So we um, you know, got all the phytoplankton down into a little bottle that we used to filter. And while we were talking about phytoplankton, its importance within the Antarctic ecosystem and also, you know, for the rest of our planet, you know, one of the guests suddenly interrupted me and said, no, 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 this is not just phytoplankton, you know, this is the gold of Antarctica. And, you know, it, it was just one of those moments, you know, that, that we as guides work towards so much. It was one of those moments where you suddenly see that it clicked, you know, you could see it in their eyes, you know, they suddenly understood how much phytoplankton means to the entire environment down there, you know, and then it's not just the penguins and the whales. And what was really cool was like, so for the rest of the trip, you know, everyone started talking about phytoplankton. It was way cooler than penguins and whales and seals. So I well think done. that's a really nice example of how you can impact their experiences right there. For sure. Hey, um, do you have another example of, you know, how maybe citizen science can change behavior at home? Um, yes. Um, yeah, there's also, um, I think, a nice example. So a few years ago, we had a guest travel with us to, um, to the polar regions and she and her partner, they participated in the onboard citizen science program. And when she came back home, she actually changed the topic of her masters to also include climate change because she suddenly was so interested in learning how climate change affected the polar regions. And what is even more amazing is that she wanted to stay involved with citizen science and the polar regions. So just recently, she joined the board of directors of the Polar Citizen Science Collective. So I think that's probably a that prime is, example of how you can change someone's experience. That is great. So Nidhi, I do have a question that is going around my head. Um, just thinking, you know, it obviously has 
a great uh, impact in guests' experience and it can change their behavior. But um, I have heard from many guests and some guides too. Do, do you think there's actually a benefit for science in doing all these projects? Yeah, this is actually a very interesting thought. And this is, I believe, one that is still floating around in the industry. And I know this from my own experience because part of the data that I use for my PhD was collected by citizens. So we had to you know, fend, defend that data all the time. And I think key here is to understand that not each project is suitable for a citizen science project. And this is something that we just all have to be honest about. Because if you imagine, you know, we would be asked to describe mating behavior or some other kind of social interactions between different um, animals. There's no way that as a non-trained researcher that you can do this properly. You would get all sorts of different explanations and that wouldn't make any sense. So if we, you know, take aside that there are some projects that we simply can't do as citizens, there are other projects where it fits, you know, taking a photograph of a whale fluke Everyone can do that, that knows how to operate a camera and the photo doesn't lie. So there's your proof, you know, this is actually really valuable data. And for those projects that do fit, the scientific value can be really huge. Because when we come back to the fact, you know, that scientific research in polar regions is extremely expensive. You know, you also have to think about the fact that scientists, they can only come down there for a certain amount of time. They can't spend the entire season down south. And in addition to this, even if they would, they would be only at one point at a time. So we as the entire fleet, you know, we can be down there the entire season, but we can also be simultaneously at different spots. So just like this, we can actually increase sample size quite significantly. And in 2015, you know, when Fjord Fido slowly started, um, Bob was actually in contact with a few of the American scientists to work on new citizen science projects for the next season. And we met some of the researchers in Edward Bay because they were down there with the American research vessel. And long story short, we had them over for dinner and they gave presentations about all the work that they do. And then there was this biologist, Dr. Maria Benet, and she asked us if we would come back to this fjord until the end of the season because it was their last week there. And we said, yes, we, we will. And then she said, oh, I brought you something here. And she, you know, opened like a bag and there were little brown bottles in there. And she asked, would you mind, you know, just collecting little water samples from this fjord every time you come here? Because what they were interested in is they wanted to see how phytoplankton is developing until the end of the season, a time where they were never there. So we did, we sent the data in. And from this, um, you know, slowly Fjord Fido started. And what the fantastic thing about Fjord Fido is, it is a project that couldn't happen without the industry. It would not be successful. And now that it is successful and that we're all participating, it is actually supporting the PhDs of two students, which I think is absolutely amazing. Yeah, it is for sure. You know, it obviously helps the scientists, all the data we collect, um, and it helps over the long term, but I know that is one example where citizen science has helped put conservation measures in place in Antarctica. Do you mind sharing that one with us? Yes, and um, once we come back to Happy Well, because it is one of like the prime examples of successful citizen science projects. So all the photos of humpback flukes that have been submitted over the past years by all the guides and all the guests they have directly led to an industry-wide slowdown during the peak Antarctic season to avoid whale collisions because now the whale population has recovered so well that there are so many humpback whales down there. And I think it is absolutely amazing, you know, that Ted with Happy Whale could prove where all these whales are and where it is important to protect them. And normally, you know, conservation measures, they don't work that quickly. And I think at this point, we have to do a big shout out to everyone involved and all the operators that made this possible because this is an absolutely fantastic example of how citizen science can actually directly help to benefit the Antarctic environment. For sure. So obviously the data has helped scientists and also the industry, right? And it's gonna help all of us, but how can we make sure that our guests stay connected with the projects once their trip is over and they go back home? Yeah, that is one of our very tricky and favorite questions. So 
I think key is that it is rewarding for guests and that there's feedback. And this is easier said than done. Um, and this is actually something that we're working really hard on within the Polar Collective to ensure that there's a way for guests to receive ongoing feedback and to stay involved with the scientific project once they're back home. And once again, I have to bring up Happy Well because they have this nailed. Um, Happy Well you know, has these wonderful email notifications that I think we all enjoy. And Ted could give you a list of hundreds of comments, maybe even more from guests how much they, these email notifications enrich their days. So I picked out just three because I thought they were quite nice. So one guest says that these email notifications about the whales, you know, he reads them every day and they are the first email that he reads every day. Some of the guests actually feel like proud parents and, you know, others, they identify and they follow their whales, you know, so they want to make sure where their whale is going. And I think like this, you know, you really connect with the animals, you connect with the environment, you follow them when they travel, you know, to their breeding grounds and then back to their feeding grounds. And again, it's one of those experiences, you know, that puts you right there. Yeah, for sure. I think feedback from these kind of citizen science projects is amazing. Um, so Neri, I'm going to change topics a little bit because we're getting a few questions about operators. So let's approach citizen science from the operator's point of view. Um, there's a question from Lisi. How can we encourage more sheep operators to offer this? Um, and she talks about her previous life as a polar sales specialist. And she really wanted to talk to clients about citizen science, but so many operators don't offer it or not consistently enough to promote it as an opportunity. And I think we're going to cover these throughout a couple of um, things we want to cover. So my question now to you would be, you know, we talked about all these benefits and, you know, what Liz is asking is, how can we encourage more sheep operator, uh, operators to offer this? How come that not everyone is doing it already? Yeah, that's a very good question because <laughs> that's exactly what I'm hoping for, that we are convincing everyone how important and valuable it is. And um, so the reasons why operators are not doing it is, is difficult to tell because each operator might have their own reasons, but, you know, certain topics do come up over and over again, like especially during different workshops that we have been doing on this topic. So, you know, some of the operators, they might worry that high costs are involved. And, you know, I think we can say quite easily that that's not the case. There's a variety of projects out there that cost hardly anything, or even nothing, you know, most of them they require maybe like a smartphone, happy well, you know, the guests actually bring the equipment themselves. It's their camera that you can use for it. So this shouldn't be an argument against it. Operators might also consider not having enough time to do so many projects. And I don't know if this is a misconception, but it actually doesn't matter if you do five projects, if you do 10, 20, or if you just do one, you know, whatever fits into your schedule and each operator schedule is very different. So some allow for more and others for less projects, but any participation, even if it's just one project and maybe just two or three samples per trip, you know, this actually has real value. So. This also shouldn't be an argument. Operators yes. might also be concerned, you know, that there's difficult logistics involved with like receiving and returning equipment and samples to and from scientists. And I think you and I, we both know this from experience, how difficult it can be, you know, to get samples forth and back. But again, it shouldn't be a limiting factor because as an operator, you have the choice to choose not to participate in such a project. And especially if you're beginning, you know, to test citizen science and see what positive effects it has, don't start with a logistically heavy project. And, you know, there are plenty of other projects available where the logistics involve emailing data sheets or uploading photos. And again, this is an area that we focus on, you know, within the Polar Collective where we're trying to help the scientists. We, we have an app, you know, where we trying to incorporate all the different projects that then facilitates data entry, but also like the transferal to the scientists. And we're also trying to work out, you know, how we can support everyone with logistics. So again, this shouldn't be, you know, stopping you. And sure. I think that there are probably many operators that already have citizen science, but that the guests are simply not aware about it prior to their trip. Well, that actually, that's a really good point and it reminds me of the very beginning um, when we were working at Polar Latitudes and we had the citizen science program but guests often commented that they were not aware of it prior to joining the cruise. So do you think maybe 
you know, citizen science can be used to generate more revenue and work as a marketing tool for some companies. Well, you're putting me on the spot here. I'm, <laughs> I'm by no means a marketing expert. And I also hope that John is not listening right now <laughs> because he would probably not want us to give away some of his secrets. So, hey, John, if you do listen, <laughs> please cover uh, your ears for the next minute or so. Um, but I, I guess it does. But I can only speak for how it worked at Polar Latitudes. So like you said, we saw on the comment forms, the guests were not aware of the citizen program prior to the trip, but that it was one of the best parts of the experience. And Polar Latitudes, you know, they started to take those comments really seriously and they began marketing citizen science better. You know, they incorporated it as a normal activity. You can see it on the website. And now we have guests saying that citizen science was one, if not the only reason that they booked with us. So probably more generally speaking, it is like a supply demand thing, you know, the more guests know about I, yeah. it, the more they might book. And it is actually something that informed travelers are starting to look for when they choose who to travel with, because prospective guests are often asking how we can justify visiting those places. So for the marketing departments out there, I mean, you know, they come up with all sorts of things that they can market today. We have kayaking, yeah. we have camping, now we have stand-up paddling, we have helicopter flights, we have submarines. So why not add you know, the simplicity of citizen science as an activity as well. And who knows what happens, you know, maybe you get an increased booking, but I think it's definitely something that we should do because we can, and also the guests are asking for it. And I'm sure it will increase bookings. Um, we've seen it, it's, it's been proved. Um, so Nidhi, it, it is undeniable that citizen science has a huge value for everyone. Um, so we got a question from Alex. How do I get involved in citizen science if my operator doesn't include it in the program on board? That is a good question. And so there are opportunities. So no one says that you can't. Um, ideally, you're backed up by the company as it might then be easier for you to do when you have the entire team behind you. Because I think we as guides, we all know how we react when someone comes along after a really long day and says, hey, can you do something else instead of enjoying your beer in the bar? But it doesn't limit you from participating. Like we said, you know, there's no prerequisites. You just need to be enthusiastic and you need to do the preparation work. And we at the Polar Collective are there to help with that as well. And, you know, I think especially for new guides, this might actually be, you know, a really cool, cool way into the team. Because as a newbie, you might not yet have all the skills needed in the Polar environment. But by knowing how citizen science works, you can add real value to your team. So nothing stops you from participating, but try as hard as you can to convince your operator. There shouldn't be any arguments left why you shouldn't do it now. Right. Well, actually, that was the way that I started in the industry um, on my, I think it was my second season um, that I got introduced to the program and yeah, I was a Zodiac driver. I was kind of an outdoors guide, but citizen science got me closer to the team. And I felt like I was able to help with more than just, you know, I felt like just driving a Zodiac and it was way more than that, but um, it, it really made me feel much better. Um, we do have another question from Michael. He wonders what other citizen science projects can be developed, like perhaps a botany based one. What do you yes. think? Um, so I think right now, the projects that are available, they are mostly you know, happening in Antarctica. We are aware of this. Um, but actually, we are in conversation with someone that wants to work, <laughs> develop like a botany project in the Arctic, especially in Greenland. Um, I think there are lots of different topics, like particular in, um, in the Arctic, anything that deals with plants is really interesting because now that we're seeing that it's getting warmer and warmer, earlier every year, you know, the flowers will also change when they're flowering. So this is, you know, definitely of interest for, for the scientists. So I think there's no, nothing that stops us from developing any sort of project, you know, as long as they're logistically possible. And quite often, most of these photos, uh, sorry, most of these projects require taking photographs, which is really easy to do. It is just a matter of connecting the scientists to us, because that particular um, scientist that I was mentioning, she, you know, just stumbled upon us because in the scientific world, I think they are also just slowly starting to realize how much value citizen science has. And once this gap is bridged, what we are trying to do, you know, with the Polar Collective, 
then I think, you know, once the scientists realize how much value that has, um, it will become more and more available. But yes, anything, you know, we could do um, glaciology, you know, plants, I don't know, everything you can come up with, drop us your ideas, you know, send them to us. Yeah, <laughs> awesome. Um, we do have a comment from Michael Shrimp from Stony Brook University and Antarctic Site Inventory. So as a recipient of some of the citizen science data coming from the program, I just wanted to thank all of you who have participated and thanks Annette for organizing. No, oh, thank you very much, Michael. <laughs> it's really nice to hear. So that also supports what we were talking about before, that it really has a huge value for scientists as well. So it does have a value for science. It's not only for our guests experience, it's not only a marketing tool, but it also really you know, it has a huge value for science. Yes, totally. So Annette, if you're okay with this, I would like to highlight three key messages that I took out of this talk as a guide looking forward to being back on a ship, you know, mm -hmm. driving, lecturing, hiking, doing citizen science. Um, and please add anything. If I'm missing something, please add it. So number one, Anyone can do citizen science, even if you have no related background. Okay, number two, it is a great tool for becoming a better educator in multiple ways. Number three, it has an all run value for all stakeholders, us as guides, but also the operators, the guests, the scientists. What do you think? Absolutely correct. And I would probably add that, you know, for all those hidden science nerds out there amongst the guides, this is your time to shine. Put on those fancy glasses. And science is science. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, you know, most of us have more free time than usual at this time of the season. I mean, most of us would be super busy on board the ship with no Wi-Fi connection. So I guess we can start preparing right now for next season. Do you think you can give us some tips on what every guy could do? Yes. So coming back to that, can I do citizen science if my company is not offering it? Yes. So what I would suggest, first of all, talk to your operator. You know, they have to do citizen science now. <laughs> then chat to us at the Polar Collective. And just as a heads up, all this information will be posted by Lauren in the next few days. So you, if you don't manage to write it all down, you will get this information. For Antarctic guides, um, you know, check out the FOM. It is in section 16. That's where you find all the science supporting material. And then, because we have more free time now, try it out because preparation is key, like we learned. And there are quite a few apps that you can download for projects that we also do in the polar regions. So if you live close to an ocean, so all those Canadian fellas, you know, and everyone that has an ocean close by, um, there's the SECI program, which also deals with phytoplankton studies. There's an app for NASA's Globe Cloud Project, and it's a really cool um, thing to do. There is iNaturalist that you can use to lock the biodiversity in your neighborhood. And then for all those bird nerds out there, there's eBird, where you can lock all your bird sightings. You can also check out SciStarter.org for projects in your area. But just as a heads up, there are also many country-specific platforms highlighting all the different citizen science projects in your area. Alone within Europe, you know, there's like five or six different ones. So I would suggest just Google it and you will find plenty of projects to do. And then if you have like me, a hard drive full of photos, this is the time to go through all of those. And if you come across anything that looks like a seal, like a weddell seal or a leopard seal, or like a whale, humpback whale, orca, fin whale, all, all, all of those different whales, send them to happywell.com. We saw how important that data is. If you happen to find an animal that has a tag on it, it's not limited to marine mammals, also birds, you can send this to polartag.org because they're also really interested in finding out you know, about those tagged animals. And if you end up participating in any great projects, tell us at the Polar Collective about it. We'd love to hear you know, from you and we'd love to hear your um, experiences and about your, get your input. And I think this should also keep us busy until the time that we can finally step back on board. Thanks, Annette. So I have another question or comment from Gerard. So when he approached Bass to discuss the options for science projects, they have rejected it. So the opinions from national science programs can be very frustrating. Any suggestions for how to better approach? 
Yeah, that is a really good comment. And unfortunately, that is still happening quite a bit. Um, we have presented the idea of citizen science at the SCAR conference, so the conference, you know, for like the Scientific Committee of Antarctic Research. And it has been interesting because it seems to be the younger generation of scientists that are more open to citizen science. And I think by having this conversation, it is always great to have like an example of how well it works in your pocket. So if you are talking to someone and they're hesitant, you know, tell them about Happy Well, you know, tell them what this has done because which other scientific project can so show such a success in such a short time? Tell them about Fjord Fido, you know, because, and I think, you know, follow Alison because she is so great at communicating her science and it is, such a fantastic program again one that is not possible without the industry and you know this is something that we are focusing within the polar collective we want to select those projects you know where you need the industry to do them and yeah unfortunately i think there will always be a few of the older generation scientists you know that are like ah oh, you know no one else can do the science it's just me i have studied for so many years and you know in the end a phd is just a certificate of endurance it doesn't really say anything else <laughs> And um, so, yeah, unfortunately we have to have this conversation more and more and more, but if you bring really supporting um, examples, I think they don't really have so many arguments left to say why it's not something we should do. I hope that's for sure. your question. And as you said, some, some projects might not be suitable for citizen science due to the nature of the project, but some others, why not? So yeah, and I will add, contact the Polar Collective, contact the, Polar Citizen Science Collective, because maybe as an organization, you can also help facilitate those conversations. Yes, yeah, thank you. That's actually a good point. But I think the more we can show them that we are aware of the fact that certain projects are suitable and others are not, you know, then we show them that we really know what we're talking about. For sure. And that should I mean, help to a certain yeah. extent. <laughs> so another question from Babsi. Is there any research being done on or planned on citizen science as a tool for creating Antarctic ambassadors? Um, that is a good <laughs> question. I think that's probably a question for Amanda from Ayado. Um, I know that there's a lot of talk on developing tools on how we can see if we are creating Antarctic ambassadors. And we have also talked to a different um, researcher that is interested in seeing the effects of citizen science on people's behaviors. So. I would say in the long term, hopefully, yes, it's not like for the next year or two, because um, we have to identify the researchers and work with them. But this will definitely be something that we want to look at, because again, if you can prove that citizen science is making a real difference, you know, hopefully scientists will be less reluctant to say, you know, I don't want to be involved in citizen science. Very good comment. Thank, though. You. <laughs> Thank you very much, Annette. Um, yeah, I think that's it for questions. So we are getting to the end of this talk and, you know, we've discussed the origins of citizen science, how we guys have grown into a role and started using it as a tool to become better educators, how companies can use it as a marketing tool. So my last question has to be about the future of citizen science. Where do you think we're heading as an industry? Well, Honestly, I think that we are seeing a change within the industry with regards to the involvement in citizen science. And to me, it seems a little bit similar um, with the PDGA, you know, when they first started appearing on the horizon, quite a lot of operators were a little bit hesitant and hadn't adopted it. But now when they're seeing the value of it more and more and more, you know, they're starting to incorporate it into it, their programs. And this is my, my opinion. I don't think that we can go to the polar regions any longer without giving anything back especially when it is so easy to do. It is such a huge privilege to visit those areas. And we always say that we want to create ambassadors. So let's use anything we can to do that. And then if you think about it, Mara, what day is today? December the 1st. And what does this mean? What will we do today down south? Celebrate Antarctica Day. Exactly. So happy Antarctica Day to everyone. And December the 1st is where we celebrate the signing of the Antarctic Treaty. And what does this treaty say? That Antarctica should be kept for peace and science. And science. <laughs> exactly. And let's face it, the polar regions are where citizen science is at its coolest.
Awesome. Thank you very much, Annette. It was amazing to chat with you. It definitely makes me feel closer. It's been a while. Yeah, it has been a while. Yeah. Thank you very Thank much. You very much and, yeah, and Nettie, you made a connection between citizen science and the PPGA, and that leads me to the next event on the agenda. So the Guides Inside Speaker Series will host Alex Cohen and PTGA President Graham Charles. So next Tuesday, tune in to hear about the PTGA past, present and future. So if you want to know everything about the PTGA, this is your opportunity to making all those burning questions you have on the back of your mind. So tune in next Tuesday and Graham and Alex will be there for you. Thank you very much and see you next Tuesday. Bye. Bye everyone.